I, I get to say at least one personal word uh, about Rebecca, uh, because I don't know about you, but the 2008 presidential election was a kind of a dream and a nightmare at the same time, don't you think? You know, two alternatives worked for so long and so hard. The man a feminist, the woman a civil rights advocate, and yet we were made to think that to make any choice, however rational, was to put one category of people in the, uh, above another. It was Rebecca who got me out of this, or at least made me understand that there was somebody who was as pissed about it as I was. Um, for someone who started her career as a journalist at a time when the market value of a female writer was greatly focused on the interest in her sex life, Rebecca changed that narrowly sexist lens and created for herself a new beat. At Salon.com, she showed the media that uh, writing politics gets attention. In her book, Big Girls Don't Cry, The Election That Changed Everything for American Women, Rebecca tells the story of the women in the 2008 elections who showed up on the national political stage and how the nation and the media responded to them. In the process, she asked some tough questions about feminism and her own generation. As Connie Schultz wrote in the Washington Post, it is a raw and brave memoir of a journalist who discovered that all is not well for women in America and a description of how she and other young women are laying claim to their rightful place in the fight. Such youthful embrace of the women's work yet to be done is exhilarating. For her generation and for mine, on behalf of the Jewish Women's Archive and all the generations represented in this room, I am so happy to present the Making Trouble, Making History Award to Rebecca Traster. Thank you so much. Um, I couldn't be more honored to be receiving this award from Gloria Steinem, whose work has inspired and invigorated and excited and engaged me from long before I was even a journalist, perhaps even before I was even a self-identified feminist. Um, I'm also incredibly honored to be receiving it alongside Elizabeth Sackler and Letty Cotton Pogerbin. I'm in such wonderful company. It's deeply humbling. Um, Thank you so much for having me. Um, when I first got this call that today was going to happen, I confess that I was not familiar enough with the Jewish Women's Archive. I knew of the org organization, but I had never really dug deep. Gloria Felt, a friend, another inspiration, a respected colleague, was the person who called to tell me about it. And she encouraged me to take a look at the website. I did. I was blown away. I got lost immediately and for like three days in the encyclopedia. Uh, here were Jewish feminists, history makers, labor leaders, teachers, lawyers, culture makers, Bella Abzug, Hannah Arendt, B. Arthur, and they were just the A's, uh, you know, <laughs> Helene Sissou, Don Steele, Emma Goldman, Rosa Luxemburg, Roseanne Barr, um, and, and more than that, hundreds of women whose names I'd never heard of before, whose stories I didn't know. These were women united by faith or by culture, or perhaps just by genetics, as Jews, included in this dizzying compendium of achievement and voice. It was a journalist's dream and also a feminist's dream. Um, I also spent time looking at the online exhibits about the feminist movement, about the civil rights movement, about Hurricane Katrina. Um, <clears throat> what the Jewish Women's Archive is doing is what all of us interested in telling women's stories and interested in women's history or as I also like to call it, history, um, <laughs> what we should all be aspiring to. <clears throat> it's the story of the United States and elsewhere, told through a particular lens, yes, and what might seem like a narrowing lens, but in fact a lens that winds up offering a far broader and more expansive view on everything from science to law to race to medicine to sports to reproductive rights policy. Uh, <laughs> 
this is not an especially empowered thing to say, but I confess that one of my first reactions um, was to be slightly flabbergasted that I had been chosen to receive this award. And in part, my concern stemmed from today's theme, making trouble, making history. Unlike Elizabeth, <clears throat> my confession is that I have not historically thought of myself as a troublemaker. Um, embarrassingly enough, I'm kind of a consummate good girl. Um, I have an arguably unhealthy respect for authority. <laughs> I dislike conflict. Uh, as a teenager, I came home on time at my curfew. I rebelled in kind of boringly appropriate ways. As an adult, I drink responsibly. I quit smoking five years ago, and I floss regularly. Um, and I, this was not the first time that I had sort of berated myself for not making enough trouble in my life. And I was thinking about it, and, and I did land on a moment in my memory, which was the moment, and there was one, when I decided to write my book on the 2008 election. It was actually quite near the end of 2008. It was a day in September, um, not long after Sarah Palin had been nominated for the vice presidency by John McCain. And I was at home sick from work with a terrible cold, all congested and stuffed up and coughing and gross. And I was sitting on my couch watching all day long cable news. And there was some pundit on television and he was explaining what Palin meant to American women. And I was sitting there and I was like, you're wrong, you're wrong, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, as far as I was concerned, here we were in the middle of history, living history, making history, seeing the world change around us. An African American man was the candidate for the presidency. And to get there, he had competed with a woman who had gotten 18 million votes. Now there was another woman who had just become a vice presidential candidate. And this guy, some fool on television, <laughs> was telling me that you know women were going to switch from Clinton to Palin because chicks dig other chicks, and that Hillary's candidacy had been a failure of the women's movement, and you know Palin was going to be an asset to the Republicans because she was hot. I mean, it was the most egregious thing, and I, I just, I was furious, <clears throat> and I was like, please make it stop. Um, you know, th this was coming from this purported authority, the man on the television. And it was just so mind-blowingly wrong. I remember this, and I think that, as it turns out, my respect for authority has its limits. Um, <clears throat> so I decided then, literally sitting on the couch, um, that I was going to write a book about the 2008 election. I wanted to write it very specifically, because that day, I understood, watching this, that there would be years in front of us of lots of other people telling the story wrong. And by the way, I'm very right about this. I don't know if any of you have been watching the news with regard to this uh, Republican primary morass, but um, <clears throat> I have heard all too often in recent weeks that because it's dragging on so long and there's difference between strategy and the caucus states versus the primary states, that this is just like 2008 and Hillary and Obama. And I listen to that on television and I say, no, no, you fools. <laughs> Four white guys arguing about birth control is nothing like Hillary and Obama. <laughs> Um, uh, I think that perhaps the reason that I'm a journalist, though I really had never considered this until I was forced to reckon with how and if I had ever made trouble, is because I'm really driven to wrest control of stories that I think are important and that are being garbled, and to tell them right, or at least the way that I think is right. And to that end, I want to conclude by touching on another story that I think a lot of people get wrong. It's about young women, um, women far younger than I. For years, I've heard complaints about how a generation of young women takes their freedoms for granted, that they're, apath that they're apathetic, that they don't call themselves feminists. Um, and I understand why that, that version of the story exists. But here's the story that I think is right that young women, and again, young, I'm 36, I'm talking about women who are in their 20s, I'm talking about women who are in their early 20s, I'm talking about women who are in their teens. They are engaging, working, and making trouble, perhaps in ways that, until very recently, have remained invisible to those outside their cohort. Thanks to technology and the internet, new ways of communicating, what they've been doing is taking control of their own stories and telling them in their ways. They know instinctively, far better than I ever did, how to use their voices, often their virtual voices, 
to challenge and increasingly gain control over narratives that have been flawed and incomplete for far too long. We can look at recent events, including the social media cru crusades against the Komen Foundation and against Rush Limbaugh, the viral organizing behind slut walks and the protests on state house steps around the country. And finally, we can see the generational engagement, old kinds of activism blending with new kinds of activism. We can see the power of the next generation working within and, and alongside other older generations. So I'm wildly, wildly honored to be here today. I can't tell you how honored and grateful and humbled I am to be here. But the people I really want to direct your attention to are some women who aren't necessarily on stage. The younger women who are making a lot of trouble all around us. Thank you very, very much.